Good morning, church. Welcome to all our guests today. We hope you feel welcome because that's the way we want it to be. God's house is full. Jesus' tomb is empty. There was a family that was watching a movie together that depicted the life of Jesus. And as it neared its climax, one of the young children was deeply moved. Tears are falling down her cheeks as she witnessed what happened to the Lord as he is being mistreated and mocked and abused. And those tears continued to flow as he was placed on the cross and as he died. And she watched in silence as he was taken down from the cross and put into the tomb. And then suddenly her expression began to change and she started to smile and rejoice and finally said out loud, now comes the good part. We can certainly appreciate her sentiments as we gather not only today, but every week as we assemble as Christians to remember the good part on the Lord's day. A day that commemorates Jesus exiting from the tomb and, and promises the same to all of us who believe. We're glad that you are here today to celebrate with us. Gospel of John chapter 20 begins with these words. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now notice at first that Mary does not believe a resurrection has taken place, but rather a theft. Jesus' body has been stolen. And Peter and John really do know better as you read on in that text in John 20, for them you see, for all of them, they had not yet gotten to the good part. I read a story one time about a famous TV show. If I name some of the characters, you'll know the show. Bert and Ernie. The Cookie Monster. What show are we talking about? Sesame Street, right? Well, one of the earliest characters on that show uh, was a human character named Mr. Hooper. His real name was Will Lee, and he was a greatly loved character in the early years of the show. If you go back far enough, fans of the show in those early years remember uh, Mr. Hooper. He was on Sesame Street for 13 years before he died unexpectedly of a heart attack in 1982. Well, the show's producers were faced with an issue of what to do now when, when this happened. How were they going to explain death to the 10 million children who watched the show at the time? Uh, they thought of several options and you know, they, they thought they could come up with a storyline about Mr. Hooper retiring to Florida or, or something like that. But instead, they decided to tell the children that Mr. Hooper had died. But because this was public television, there was great reluctance to mention anything religious or spiritual related to this event. And so on the day of the show... Uh, Big Bird walked out and said he had a drawing to give Mr. Hooper. And he said, I can't wait to see Mr. Hooper again. And then 
one of the cast members said, remember, Big Bird, we told you Mr. Hooper died. And Big Bird said, oh, yeah, I forgot. Well, I'll, I'll give it to him when he gets back. And the cast member went up to Big Bird and, and wrapped her arms around him and said, Big Bird, Mr. Hooper isn't coming back. Why not? Big Bird asked, sort of innocently. And then another cast member said, Big Bird, when people die, they don't come back. We might ask, when's the good part? Where's the good news? Sometimes it's hard to find on television. You know, the secular gospel is really not a gospel at all because gospel means good news, doesn't it? There's no good news in the message when people die, they don't come back. No good news in that. And early on that first Lord's Day, as we read in John chapter 20, Mary and Peter and John, at first, they didn't know about the good part either. And so we come back to Mary, among the last ones at the cross, and the very first one at the tomb. Let's see how she learns a, a different truth than what they taught on Sesame Street. John chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So Mary discovers the good part through a series of questions, questions that she had to answer. The first question she had to answer was, why are you crying? Now, I've heard it said that you're never supposed to ask a person why they're crying. But apparently, neither angels nor Jesus himself ever got that advice because twice Mary has asked this very thing. She peers into the tomb. She sees two angels sitting where the body of Jesus once was, and they ask her, why are you crying? She gives her answer. Uh, we might call it a, a, a child's answer, uh, a bad news answer. Her working theory is that someone has stolen the corpse of her Lord. Next, she turned around and saw the gardener. At least that's all her 
tear-soaked eyes, her bad news eyes, would allow her to see at that moment. And, and he asked her again, same question, why are you crying? Again, she gives her answer. But he also asks her a second question. Whom are you seeking? Who are you looking for? I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but consider for a moment what she says as she answers that second question. She says, sir, if you've carried him away, please show me where you put him so I can go get him. She may not have discovered the good part yet, but she loved her Lord. She loved her Lord. You think about it, how was this one woman going to carry the dead body of a man laden with an extra 75 pounds of burial spices back into the tomb or wherever it was she had in mind to take him. How was that going to happen? All she knew was that, that he was her Lord and she was devoted to him. You know, her hope may have been shattered, her faith may have been shaky, but her love was strong. And her love for the Lord led her to the good part. Because, of course, this wasn't really the gardener, was it? The gardener was really Jesus, and, and Jesus loved Mary. And, and he quickly reveals himself to her by speaking her name. And no doubt in a very familiar but gentle way. And, and she falls before him in worship. She clings to him, clings to her teacher, and seems to be renewed in hope and faith. And, and so much so that she will soon run to the other disciples. Think of this, proclaiming for the first time the gospel message. I have seen the Lord. The first question was brought on by, by Mary's sorrow. Why are you crying? The second question revealed what she was seeking. What are you looking for? And those are questions still that need answers today. Why are you crying? What's troubling you in your life? What causes you pain and sorrow and hurt and, and, and anxiety and worry today? None of us are immune to these things, to, to hurts and tears. And there is indeed a Lord who's able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. He still asks people, like Mary, why are you crying? And it's a question that we need to answer. You know, we can learn some of the greatest truths in life in times of sorrow. In times where we're hurt. Maybe you've heard this verse by Robert Browning Hamilton. He wrote, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Mary learned the greatest thing, the greatest thing in her darkest hour. And part of the reason she did was that she answered question number two. 
Question number two is, who are you looking for? Now, we know who she was looking for. What about you? Are, are you seeking truth, purpose, answers? That one key to life that will make everything better? You may remember the old movie, City Slickers. One of the stars in that movie is Jack Palance. He plays this crusty old cowboy. And uh, he tries to help another character, Billy Crystal, discover truth in the course of this film. And, and he says to him, do you know what the secret of life is? And he holds up one finger, and he says this. This is the secret. And Billy Crystal, in his smart aleck way, says, your finger? And Palance, the cowboy, says, one thing. One thing. Just one thing. You stick to that, and the rest don't mean anything. And he sort of rides off on his horse, towards the sunset, and Billy shouts after him, but what's the one thing? And Palance turns and says, that's what you have to find out. Well, there, there is some truth to that. Now, I wish that, that Palance had known or told the full story. Mary knew what that one thing was, Jesus. On another occasion, to a woman named Martha, Jesus spoke about a different Mary altogether. He said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Well, the thing that Mary, that Mary had chosen, was Jesus. She was sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to him, much like Mary Magdalene in our passage today. I just picture this woman with arms clinging to Jesus her Lord, once she had discovered the good part. Brings us to question number three. This is a question that's not based on sorrow or seeking. It's really based on surrender. It was not directly asked of Mary Magdalene in this story but the effect is the same. The question is, will you make Jesus your Lord? Recognizing that he is the living God, will you bow before him and acknowledge your allegiance to him? Will you confess your faith in him? The scripture says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Then it goes on in another place and it says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. See, all of this is tied together. And it has to do with me and you. Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection and my response to all those things. The good part 
demands a response on my part. There was a certain Muslim man who had become a follower of Jesus. And he was asked about it, and he discussed why. And he said the following. He said, I was looking at the lives of Muhammad and of Jesus. And then I came to a fork in the road. One led to death and a tomb in Medina. The other led to an empty tomb and a resurrection. I decided to follow the way of life. Then the story is told of some missionaries a few years back in Bangladesh. As part of their outreach, they were showing a film, a film about Jesus. There were several hundred villagers assembled under this tent in sweltering heat watching this film about Jesus and, and many of them, if not most of them, had never even heard the name. This was their first time. And they sat and, and watched and listened and they were enthralled with the life that was being portrayed, the life of Jesus. But then again, as, as the torture and the crucifixion of Jesus proceeded, there were tears and gasped and even people getting upset and, and yelling in response to the treatment that they were seeing aimed at this man that they were falling in love with. And it became pretty chaotic. There was a lot of tumult in the crowd as Jesus was mistreated. There's fears that the whole thing was going to sort of fall apart. And suddenly, a young man in the crowd jumped up and, and shouted for everybody to hear, don't be afraid. He gets up again. I saw it all before. That's the good part. That's our good news today. That's, that's our gospel. It's what we have to offer you. We've seen the Lord. He gets up again. Don't be afraid. Muhammad was wrong. Sesame Street was wrong. The skeptics are wrong. People do come back and get up after they die. And the first to do so was Jesus the Christ the Son of God. Do you believe this? If so, respond. While together we stand and sing.